Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to a new week. Hope you had a great weekend. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Uh, so maybe one of us can uh, please lead in prayer before we begin the class. Any one of us can lead, please. Okay, let's pray. Yes, go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the great things you've done in our lives. We thank you for allowing us to meet together. Lord, you promised that when two or three have gathered in your name, you will be in their midst. So we trust that you are in the midst of us, regardless of the geographical distances, because you are a spirit, O oh Lord. Now, Lord, abide with us here. Lord, help us to understand and also work with our teacher. Give him the Holy Spirit's unction and the right vocabulary that even the methods he will use will be suitable for us to understand, that your name will be glorified. For in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. 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 Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Right. Uh, so let's uh, begin today's class. Uh, I just want to remind us that uh, I have posted the midterm, uh, uh, you know, the midterm assessment. So uh, feel free to, you know, just go ahead and, uh, you know, f finish the assignment, and then you can post it back on the classwork tab. All right. So we're almost coming to the end of our uh, study. We have uh, a little bit more. We're going into section three uh, today. So last week we talked about uh, building people relation you know relational being relationship right building relationships within as a cell group as a leader that's something that we must do uh, build relationships be a people person uh, then we also talked about uh, the ability to counsel right as leaders uh, yes we must develop the ability to counsel uh, uh, as just how we develop the ability to uh, minister the word, read the word, uh, preach and teach and all of that, we must also develop the ability to counsel one another. And uh, of course, we do know that uh, there are certain cases where, uh, you know, this, uh, they would, people would need professional counseling. And so then you can just transition over and uh, hand over the case to somebody else. But, oh, but we must have at least some uh, basic kind of uh, counseling skills. So today, We'll go into step three, which is raising up disciples and reproducing leaders. Right? Raising up disciples and reproducing leaders. Right. Okay. Church leadership. Now, I hope this is visible for each of you. Uh, just make it a little bigger. Okay. Right. So, church leadership. Um, when we talk about leadership, oh, you know, uh, the first thing that probably comes to our mind is responsibility, right? Uh, uh, and and especially when you talk, when you look at the corporate sector, when you talk about a leader, it involves a lot of responsibilities, delegation, right? Uh, let's look at what church leadership is. Of course, in the corporate and in the ministry. You know, the, the word leadership, it doesn't mean the changes, but the attributes or the principles of leadership in a church and in the corporate sector, they definitely will change, right? So leadership in the church is important, right? Uh, here's what Dr. C. Peter Wagner lists out, one of the most important keys of the church, of church growth as a pastor who is a possibility thinker and whose dynamic leadership has been used to catalyze the entire church into action for dynamic growth, right? So uh, it, it's so wonderful. It says that uh, a person or a pastor or a leader who's thinking and whose dynamic leadership has been used to catalyze church members or the entire church into action. Right now, we must understand in a church there are people coming from different cultures, different facets of life. There are youth, there are teens, there are 
young couples, there are mid-age couples with children, uh, and then there is older couples as well, right? Senior uh, uh, citizens. So they all come with, you know, th there are different walks in their lives. Uh, some are enthusiastic, some just come, they want to attend church and go, uh, you know, so there are different kinds of people. But as a leader, a, a, a leader, a pastor, who's probably leading a group, his thinking or his dynamic leadership uh, can be used to catalyze the entire church into action. Right? Uh, so for example, there's a, there's a church. This is just an example, right? Well, there's a church, and they're meeting every Sundays. It's been a year. There are 50 people at the church, right? So the 2023 has 2022. It's been 50 people. 23, uh, 2023 has started. It's been 50 people. And there's no growth in the church. Right? Now, as a leader, first thing I must do is I should think, what's what? Why? What is happening? Uh, am I am I not able to, uh, you know, use our church folks to, you know, uh, get them to be, uh, uh, you know, passionate and you know their their zeal for the Lord should be should grow and how do I do that these are certain things that we must think about right now, of course there are 50 people in the church for example then we try to equip those 50 people and that they go out and bring many more people now oh this is survey I was reading 80 percent of church growth happens within the church right so for example you have people in the church they will go and invite other people to church. 80% of it is that way. That is through one-on-one -on -one relationships and uh, you know, just by inviting them. So it's 80%. Right? Uh, so as leaders, we must be dynamic in our leadership. Right? Uh, yes, there will be ups and downs. Some days we feel you know strong in the Lord, we feel energized. Some days we may feel weak, we may feel tired may feel weary, but it is during those times when you pick, we have to pick ourselves up and say, okay, we're doing this because uh, I need to be a dynamic leader because what, how I portray, uh, or how, what I do as a leader is going to affect the church. It's going to affect the cell group or it's going to affect the people under me, right? So uh, very, very important. Right? You know, as leaders, we must have a dynamic possible, you know, uh, 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 of futuristic thinking, uh, uh, be wise in our decision, be dynamic leaders, and that will just overflow into your team, into your church members. Right now, let's look at this: the universal principle of church leadership. Now, as I keep teaching, feel free to just uh, unmute, and if you have any questions, any thoughts, feel free. You can also post your questions we will stop and, and we will answer those questions right? Uh, right the universal principle of church leadership leaders will build great churches average leaders will be average churches anti-leaders will harm and break down churches as well as church leaders and their visions for god look at that uh, uh, it's so it's self-explanatory. Great leaders will be great churches. Average leaders will be average churches. Anti-leaders are leaders who are against uh, against the church and against the things of God. They will harm and break down churches as well as church leaders. Right? So wise leaders know that they must utilize all available leadership to the maximum and therefore concentrate on equipping and mobilizing them function as well as possible right so let me give you a couple of examples right so for example uh you got it there's a church and, and there's only 50 people but in those 50 people you have maybe for example you know five people who are in the corporate sector they are high up they've you know matured and uh they're you know, uh, up in the ranks in leadership skills, right? Now, in the corporate sector, Monday to Friday, they are managers, senior managers, right? Now, on Sunday, they just come to church, sit and go, 
right? So, what must we do as leaders? Right? First thing we must do is we must use available, utilize all available leadership to the maximum of our ability. So, what we can do is, hey. I want to just talk to you five leaders, you know, five of them from the corporate sector. So you speak to them. You say, see, I know we are a small church, but, you know, uh, the vision is one day we're going to become a big church. We're going to grow. We're going to be 200, 300, 500 people. Uh, and so we would need to begin to work that way. So can we have different teams? Let's have one of you take care of the welcome team. One of you take care of the, uh, you know, the ushering team or one of you take care of the book table team. Uh, one of you can, you know, uh, probably take care of the media team, right? So you assign them. Now these are leaders in the corporate sector, right? What do they do? They will do it really well. And one of the things, you know, I've noticed as a, as a leader, as, uh, you know, as, as the pastor in the church, you know, these people who are in corporate sectors and people who are really high up in leadership, you share a vision with them. You share with them, hey, this is what we want to do. They work on it immediately, right? Without a vision, they they feel out of place. So I remember this. This one time, I, I shared with a couple of uh, men who are uh, there was two men and one uh, lady in our church, one, one, and they all are up in the ranks, right? In corporate. Uh, leadership so they're all above senior managers so I, told, I just began to talk to them hey why don't we do these things and they took it on they say took it to another level you know they just you know they had everything ready they had a pie chart they had a uh, you know documents ready they said okay this is how we we'll do it this is the vision for one year and they made a five-year vision and what was the thing about it was about the uh, I think it was uh, the welcome lounge, right? So when new visitors come, we direct them to the welcome lounge, greet them, you know, just uh, uh, give them some refreshments, but feel, make them feel welcome, thank them for coming to church. That was the thing. And they made a five-year vision. They said, this is how we can do it. These are the things that we may need. You know, everything was documented. And I was, wow, look at that. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not that they're just, Know, simply up in the ranks they know what they do they were so articulate every everything was considered and i thought to myself that that day we have such wonderful leaders in the church and sometimes they we don't know sometimes we just think that hey uh, i am the preacher or i'm going to teach i'm going to preach i have to do everything no not really there are people in within the church within the ministries who have great potential but haven't been given the opportunity at all right now this other thing happened with one one uh one uh you know, one person at church and uh, uh one day uh, as i was talking to her she said uh you know one thing i'd like to do is pray she said i was like wow you know not many people uh spend hours in that so i began to talk to her and i was she was saying uh, of course she's married uh, her children are grown up but she was saying Oh, I love to pray. I, uh, I know after I finish all my chores at home, I spent hours in prayer. And every time she prayed during the prayer time in church, there was this this passion, this zeal that she prayed with. It didn't matter to her whether there was one person or ten people or hundred people. It was the same zeal. It was the same passion. So I remember going up to her one day and saying, hey, "Why don't you lead the prayer team?" And why don't you join the prayer team first and then eventually you can lead the prayer team and she joined the prayer team and, and then she you know, she started rostering people in the prayer team and, and she says i feel so satisfied just being in these teams right success in the ministry is based on the ability to raise up successors so therefore success without raising successors is a failure. That's strong words, right? Success in ministry is based on the ability to raise up a success, raise up people, raise up leaders in every team. Uh, and when we do that, we know that we are being successful. Because sometimes as a ministry grows, we may feel that, okay, uh, you know, this is enough. 
right? So for example, for the welcome team, you have five people right now where the church is maybe uh, 50 people. Now, once it's 200 people, you can't have five, you know, five people in the welcome team. You need more than that, right? So we need to teach, even as we train others uh, in ministry, we need to teach our leaders to train others, right? So there needs to be a successor. There needs to be the growth in ministry teams as well. Great leaders understand how to get everyone to participate. Very important. Everyone are important in the church, right? Uh, uh, now, there will be times when people will come up to you and uh, as a pastor, as a leader, they may share things with you, right? Uh, personal things, personal challenges. So this one time, I remember this uh, gentleman, he was, he's about his, uh, maybe his early 40s. He's going through a rough patch in his life. Just, um, this is a season of uh, you know, tiredness, weariness. He got laid off his job got you know commitments and he was so broken and the church was you know he was beginning to flow the gifts of the spirit at the previous church that he was going to was you know saying you know you can't do this you can't uh, so he felt there was uh, you know uh, uh, he, he didn't feel that he could be himself so uh, he was going through a lot and he he just stepped into our church once this is a couple of years back uh, and I, uh, I, I remember talking to him, and he was saying, you know, this is the thing: you know, problems in the family, problems at work, I've been laid off at work, I have commitments. Everything was going wrong. His children didn't, you know, respect him. And they were, you know, they were living a very carefree life. So he was very broken. But he had come to church, right? So then, after a couple of weeks, after you know, four or five weeks, I saw that he's been regular to church. So I asked him, "What do you do?" Right? What do you do? He said, oh, I'm an IT, all this uh, IT work with a laptop and all these things. Oh, but what are you passionate about? He said, I'm passionate about uh, uh, sound. I've always wanted to be a sound engineer. So I remember telling him, hey, you know what? We need people in the sound and setup team. So I told him, see, this is a thing. Sound and setup team, you have to come at 6 AM in the morning. And then the, you have to set up everything. Uh, the mics, the sound system, the monitors, everything need to be set up. And then it should be ready by 7.30 because 7.30 the worship team will come and they have their sound check. And 8 o'clock the Sunday service prayer starts. So do you think you can come at 6 a.m.? Like, he said, yes, I'll come. And it was just a couple of weeks, maybe about four to five weeks, but then he started coming for the sound and setup. And little did I know that, you know, after some time, the people on the team, uh, the Southern Setup team came up to me and said, oh, this new, this person, he knows everything about, the, the, you know, those mixers and all those things, all how do you use them? Uh, he knows everything. He's like an audio engineer. So I went up to him and I said, hey, I heard that you know everything about this. And uh, uh, he said, yes, I was very passionate about it. I learned everything. And, on my own and so I know most of it and you see <clears throat> oh, what I'm trying to say is there are people with different skills different abilities and unless the opportunity is given to them you may not know what they're able to do right uh, and now he's leading up the sound and setup team he's a leader he trains those in the sound and setup team because he's so good so passionate about what he does and he's been committed to the church committed to coming early uh, so uh, you know uh, it, it's great to get everyone to participate along with the pastor the rest of the leadership must be totally committed to the church growth a leader's effectiveness is greatly influenced by those closest to him that is his leadership team right let's read that again a leader's leaders effectiveness is greatly influenced by those closest to him that is his leadership team now as a leader you will have a team right remember we talked about this previously as well we cannot do ministry alone ministry is about people and great leader will raise up teams greater raise up other leaders and work together as a team but imagine this Imagine there's a 
pastor in the church, right? And he is always grumbling, always angry, always upset about things that are happening. What's going to happen? Well, the leadership closest to them will say, oh, man, he's, he's come. I wonder what kind of mood he is in today. Is he angry? Is he upset? Is he, uh, and what's going to happen? That it, it, it's going to, uh, you know, the effectiveness, the leader's effectiveness uh, is, is you know, others in the team, his team members are greatly influenced by it. Right? If you have a leader who's upright, who's always uh, positive, who's always, you know, looking at things and saying, hey, you know, this is a vision, this is what we can do, don't worry about our failures, we'll pick up our socks, we will continue to do what we're doing. Uh, yes, there will be times we will fail, let's continue to trust God, God has a vision for us. Um, you now, there will be ups and downs, and hey, you're, you're just, you're just, you know, re-energizing your team. What will happen? The team is going to say, hey, yes, God is with us. Thank you. And we, we begin to influence the people under us. Right? So uh, uh, you have a senior pastor, then you have the, the associate pastor. The associate pastors begin to walk in that same anointing, that same effectiveness, saying, wow, you know, this is what he said, and this is what we can do. And so we begin to you know, release that to our leadership team within the church. Right? When people follow a leader because they want to, he's on his way of great achievement. But here's an important point. One day, we too will pass away. Any investment we wish to make in our succeeding generation, we must deposit into the lives of those who come after us. And very important. No, uh, I, I just reminded of this example, right? In the book of Deuteronomy, uh, what happened was the people of Egypt, people of Israel have come out of Egypt. And after coming out of Egypt, a whole new, so God told Moses, this generation will not enter the promised land, but a whole new generation will enter it. So those who entered into the promised land was a new generation. Probably some were born in the promised land, you know. And um, yeah, and and some of them were maybe small little children, and they've gone into the promised land. Everything is fine here, you know. There's it's a land flowing with milk and honey. There's uh, good cultivation, good crops, uh, good rain, good harvest, good weather, good work, good. There's water. There's everything is available there in Kenya. Now, what was the mistake? The People did not invest into the next generation, the Israelites. So what happened was they did not tell their children what happened. They did not tell their children that, you know, hey, you, you know, why are we in this land? Because one day we were in Egypt. We were in bondage. The Egyptians used to beat us. The Egyptians used us as slaves for 400 years. But with God's mighty hand, we came out. And we came out to that desert. And God did these wonderful miracles. He parted the seas into two. He, uh, there was a pillar of cloud. Uh, he did mighty works. He spoke to us on the mountain. And then we came out of Egypt. We were wandering that desert because of our sin. We, it took us what, to, what should take about 15 days. It took us 40 years. And now we are here in, in the land of Canaan because God had promised us this, this land. And he has faithfully given us this land. They did not teach it to the next generation. So the next generation had no clue what had happened in the past. That is why the book of Deuteronomy, which is Deuto the second time, was written as a reminder. Listen, this is what happened to you. This is what you were. This is how God brought you out of Egypt. So the whole book of Deuteronomy is remember, remember this happened, remember that happened. If we want to see, you know, we must understand that we're going to move on, right? Uh, we need to start investing in our next generation, right? Uh, uh, that is why, you know, some of the things that we teach in our, at APC, especially in our children's church, it's not about, you know, uh, it's not, just you know, children's things. It's 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 bigger things, right? Uh, some of the material that we do is uh, is what we are studying. 
because nowadays children are their IQ levels are very high they are able to grasp they're able to learn they're able to understand they have questions and by the time they're teens they have a great ability to grasp things that are happening around us now picture this 10 years ago um, or 15 years ago were children able to you know use phones and tabs and they know how to go and you know, download and do all these kinds of things they didn't know they had no clue but now you have a three-year-old uh, starting from probably three years old they know exactly where to go they know what to do they know how to get it done they want to download things they get it downloaded they know how to do it so you see this generations changes and now 10 years down the line uh, you know we never know how church is going to be how leadership is going to be how uh, things are going to change but we need to start depositing into our children's lives right now that that is uh, the, the rich deposit is very important for our next leaders so you know some of the things that uh, I personally do is uh, now this is just something that I personally do uh, is whenever I you know children with my children whenever they are you know around and they do something wrong or uh, they have a question you know if we make it a teachable moment right uh, you teach them through the word of god what does the word of god say i remember last week uh, you now my son came up to me and said why do we have to put money in that box oh, that all oh, that bag which color you know everyone passed the bag i said that's an offering to the lord oh, what is that and so it became a teachable moment, right? So, okay, this is what it is. God gives us, and we give back to God as a sign of our faithfulness. Of course, I can use those big words, but just trying to make them understand. Uh, you know, and sometimes what I do is, you know, whenever there's prayers, or whenever there's, uh, you know, worship sessions, I just take them along. Now, they may not be, you know, sitting for the entire time, but uh, whenever possible, when I take them, they can at least watch, they get an idea. Uh, okay, this is what is worship uh, or, and prayer. And then when you go back home, you know, you can just talk to them and say, hey, uh, you know, during the song, which is your favorite song? And so basically what we're doing is at a young age, we're trying to, you know, put in a deposit of God to their lives. Those seeds will uh, bear fruit to their lives, right? Uh, any questions uh, before we go into uh, next step? Any questions? Okay. Okay. Training cell members into cell leaders. Right now we talked about this, right? Remember the the APC twelve model, right? We talked about it uh, somewhere in the beginning of this course. The APC twelve model was one leader. You have twelve people in your life group, and those twelve eventually all 12 of them become leaders and start their own life groups right so we talked about that that's our that's our goal we want to see that happen uh, but how do we do that what are the steps that are or what are the things that we must keep in mind as leaders uh, you know as we raise up cell members to become cell leaders let's look at this step one develop relationships with members uh, as a cell leader, we must develop relationship, right? Uh, again, remember, we are we need to be relational. We need to be people persons, right? We need to be, a, be able to develop the ability to, right? You know, be uh, close to one another to develop relationships. So this comes over time, right? Uh, and as we develop relationships with cell members. Uh, Gently, we point them down the path of a greater ministry. Uh, meaning, we tell them, uh, you know, uh, just gently, we can say, hey, you know, we're starting this life group. Uh, maybe one year down the line, you can say, hey, you know, uh, as a life group, we want to see, uh, you know, we, uh, our goal is to raise up many more leaders. So, do you think, uh, you know, you? you can lead a cell group. It's, a, it's something that you can just consider, right? And, if they, and give them time, right? Give them time, say, hey, take your time, uh, let me know. And don't, there's no pressure, 
then let me know whether you uh, even if you don't want to you're always welcome back to be part of the cell group uh, but look for those who have heart, a heart for God uh, and that is the most important attribute other things can be learned right uh, you know uh, teaching preaching uh, leadership skills all of that can be learned over time right but do they have a heart to God once they have a heart or a passion or zeal uh, to do things for God, all the other things, all the other uh, attributes can be developed as a leader, right? Uh, spend time with them doing things they they enjoy doing, invite them to your home, help them with projects. Uh, you know, Jesus was, uh, disciples were his best friends. So it's not like Jesus had some uh, you know, 12 disciples, and then he had some other best friends somewhere else. No. Of course, uh, you know, we know that Jesus, there's no partiality, but he, he, he had best friends. And he was always with them. I, I, and I always wonder, right, imagine those 12 disciples, the Son of God, wherever they were going, they saw the humanity of Jesus, the humanity of him. And when we... Uh, uh, that's something that we may not get an opportunity to see. But they saw God become flesh. They saw the humanity, this man uh, just walking around, and uh, you know, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. They went together. They ate together. They slept together. They, uh, they probably had uh, meals together. So much together. They planned out together. Uh, everything was done together. Right. Oh, and after that, after three years, three and a half years, he says, now it's time for you to go. Because he built a relationship with them. Right? Relationship is a foundation stone to obtaining the best out of people. You have to win their hearts before you can win their hands. What a powerful point this is, right? You have to win their hearts before you win their hands. We cannot expect people to keep doing things. Hey, you have to volunteer, you have to volunteer, you have to volunteer. You know, we don't have volunteers, please volunteer. We can keep doing that. And if we haven't won their hearts, uh, they may be obligated to do what they're doing. Right? And there's no joy in that. Uh, so you have to win their hearts first. Uh, so as a leader, one of the things that you can do is yeah, especially if you're a cell leader uh, and, and you know that you know there are 12 people in your cell group but there are three or four people who are very passionate very zealous for God just try to spend that additional time with them right maybe just get together talk things be there you know uh, win their hearts now it's not like you're gonna win their heart just to you know, to make them uh, you know, uh, work in the ministry or volunteer or do more things. It's not about that. It's just that you are building a good relationship, right? And there's, there's this wonderful unity that has been developed. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a joy. It's such a joy for that to happen. You know? oh, especially when, as, as, a, as a pastor, I can say that you know, sometimes we need people Volunteers, we need people for, uh, you know, teams and uh, you know, for all that is happening within the church. Uh, but there are times that people don't want to step in; they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, serve and all of that. So it's, it's okay. Uh, Mind is this one person, you know, at, uh, at church. Um, uh, he stays very far off, so about thirty kilometers away. And so they had moved to another place, and our service starts at eight a.m. Right. But one thing I knew that he is uh, a leader in the corporate sector, right? so he can really be a good team leader. So I went up to him one Sunday. I said, "Hey, you know, how are you doing? How are things? Uh, how's your life? How's the work?" And just began to casually talk to him. And I asked him, uh, "You know, this is something we need a team leader to look after. Uh, something you know, in terms of caring for the members." And, uh, is it something that he said, no, I can't do it. Uh, I come from, I moved my house 30 kilometers away. I just thought I'll come today, but I will not come every Sunday, right? Uh, and I said, okay, 
uh, understandable. The thirty kilometers away. So I remember this thing. Okay, it's all right. But in case you want to serve with any teams, just let me know. Uh, yes, there is a need. Uh, so, as he said, he never came every Sunday, right? Because it was a genuine reason. It's too far. Thirty kilometers, eight a.m. service. It's not easy. But um, maybe now and then I would just uh, you know uh, talk to him. Because one thing I knew that he 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 would also attend our service online, right? So, uh, so he needed somebody to just talk to and uh, being ministered to. So every now and then I would call him, talk to him, and I build a relationship. Right? Meaning I just got to know who he is, what what work he does, uh, and uh, you know about his family, about you know, just general things. And he began to share his prayer requests. Every now and then I would send him some WhatsApp messages and. You know, we just built a genuine relationship. Now, it's not that I built this relationship so that he comes to church. You know, I knew that, hey, he's part of ABC. He's part of our church. He's, you know, God has placed him under our leadership. So we must take care of them. We must be you know, people who can bless them. Right? So, And I knew that you know, this person is very far away. He can't come. He's been watching online. So we need to minister to him. And, and so every now and then I would call and say, hey, how is, how is, the, how is the Sunday service? So did you, uh, you know, you watched online. So uh, did you enjoy the service? Uh, did you enjoy the word? Uh, you know, just over time. And a couple of months went by. And uh, he started coming to church every week. And I saw him every week he would come. He would come and meet me. He would begin to talk to people in the church. And he would come with his family, so uh, and his children would attend uh, children's church and teen church. He had a teen son, and every week they've been coming. And so it was a month. I saw that every week they were coming, and then after that, he just came up to us and he said, uh, "You know, I mean, with some of the leaders, he said, oh, I would like to serve in any uh, team." I said, "Yeah, sure," and he served. For a month and he saw every week he was coming and he would sometimes be there at 7 30 a.m right uh he was there he was serving and then eventually he became the team leader of one of our teams team leader right so so you know uh, it's not something that i had to force him i didn't say you know something where you have to get up come on it's once a week you, you know you, uh, just do it for the Lord. God will bless you. And you don't have to say all of that. Just build a relationship. Win their hearts. And you know that every Sunday, 30 kilometers away, he's there at 7.30 a.m. with his family. And when you win their hearts, they will do all that they can. They will give their best for uh, the team and for the church. Right? Step two, develop ministers out of members. Uh, uh, after you've developed that initial friendship and you get them to, to leadership, uh, uh, you test their willingness to serve, take them with you as your minister, right? Uh, meaning ask leaders to be part of the cell group. Uh, you know, there are be times when there are new cell groups starting. Maybe you can ask them to join you where, wherever you go. Uh, challenge them to think about other cell groups, how uh, cell members, the needs and responses. Like, for example, there'll be some people in the cell group who want to be prayed for. So you give them an opportunity. Hey, why don't you pray uh, for this person? And then, you know, or why don't you minister to this person? Well, right? So remember, all this is being done while they are members, because they are still developing them into that leadership, right? Uh, now, even as you do that, very important is to check their attitude, right? Because sometimes, and we talked about this uh, previously also uh, a little bit, leadership should not be given in a hurry. Book of Proverbs talks about it, right? Uh, leadership should never be given in a haste, right? Uh, look at their attitude because see, there's gifts, there's talents which God has placed in us. That's wonderful. Uh, but attitude supersedes all of these gifts. If you have these wonderful gifts and talents that God has blessed us with, but our attitude is not right, we're always mocking, ridiculing, talking wrong things, or uh, you know, belittling people, that's not the right attitude. But the gifts will still remain. 
the bible teaches us that uh, the uh, the gifts of god are irrevocable god has placed those gifts and talents right uh, but it's our attitude which we which we need to maintain right uh, check on their uh, work or what they've been doing have they been able to spend time have they been able to uh, grow in leadership look at you know especially when you you, know, you think of raising up potential leaders see uh, you know don't ignore these vital areas right like in the sense uh, are they are they open to all kinds of ministry are they willing to do the smallest of tasks are they faithful in those small things uh, you know there will be meetings there will be seminars are they willing to come uh, these are small things yet very important things uh, leaders who have no heart for the lost or mentor-based discipleship have been given groups which then stagnate right so if there are people who have leaders who have no heart for ministry or uh, you know there's no heart for leadership for raising up other leaders what will happen is that church or that ministry or that team will stagnate right so uh, even as we develop ministers, give them time, uh, but also give them opportunities to step out, right? Stage three, make the challenge. After you, probably you, you know, you give them six months or a year, you built your relationship, you've given them six to seven months or even a year to you know, just step out, begin to uh, check on their leadership skills. Are they able to minister to people? Are they doing the tasks that have been they've been assigned uh, and when you feel that they are ready just train them and assign them to be cell group leaders give them responsibilities but don't give them a title uh, because give them confidence help them to be uh, you know share what you have seen in him publicly encourage them share what you uh, that you worked along with them respect them honor them uh, uh, remember that they are co laborers Ask them to, you know, uh, uh, you know. Just basically, you're telling the church, you're telling the life group members, hey, this person, you know, I've seen his work. I've seen that over the past year, I've been working with him closely. Uh, he has you know, done a wonderful work. He has been faithful in serving. Uh, you know, uh, so he's a co laborer of Christ, and so now we are. No, we respect him, we honor him, and we release him to be a leader. And he's going to start, he or she is going to start their own cell group. So let's pray and bless them. Basically, what you're doing, you're publicly, you're saying that we have tested, we have seen, and he will do a good work. Even as I say this, I think one of the most perfect examples would be that of Paul and Timothy. Timothy as a young boy about 17 years old Paul picks him up and says come on let's go let's go for our missionary journeys and he takes him and he sees Paul Timothy sees everything right everything he sees he sees Paul being beaten put into prison he's seeing Paul's attitude he's seeing Paul how he has served uh, even in the troubles, what kind of attitude he has, how hardworking he is, everything he has seen, right? And now Timothy, uh, now, you know, Paul is getting old. He knew that there's something important for Timothy. And so towards the end, he says, okay, Timothy, here you go. You pastor this church in Ephesus. The church is already a well-established church. They have bishops, deacons, overseers, everything is there. The church is a growing church, but it's a, it's a it's a hostile place, Ephesus. There's going to be problems there, Paul, uh, Timothy. So uh, you go and lead the church there. So what is he saying to the church? He's saying, listen, Timothy, my fellow worker in Christ. He's writing to the church in Ephesus. He's my fellow worker in Christ, right? Uh, he's my brother in Christ. He's my co-laborer in Christ. Uh, uh, he has the same spirit that I have. He's writing all this. Like, you know, Paul doesn't say, this boy, I only took him up. I'm the one who chose him. I know what I should do with him. Right? Uh, no. 
God. And he says, he's a co-laborer. He's my son. He's my, uh, he has the same spirit in me. So honor him. Uh, don't let, and he said in Timothy, don't let others despise you because of your youth or for your young age. Uh, there may be people bigger than you. They may know more than you, but you are the leader in Ephesus. So we see that. Right? Uh, <clears throat> finally, step four, help them to start their cell. Right? So even as you, uh, uh, you release them, it's not that you release them and tell them, hey, you go and uh, start your cell group. Some of the things that we can do is probably connect people to their cell group, provide them with uh, you know, names and numbers of those who you who they can connect to. So you don't spoon feed them, uh, 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 but you learn to delegate. Right? Uh, you tell him or her to do it. Right? So these are 10 numbers. Even as you start the cell group, go back home, call them up, let them know you started the cell group. Give them the timing, give them the date, um, and follow up with them. And then let me know what, what, what is their response. So you're, you're helping them to start. Uh, I let people test their wings. If you only do things you know well and do comfortably, you'll never reach higher goals. Right? So help them to you know, now imagine if you raise up a cell leader and the, you give them 10 numbers and say, hey, you'll have to go back, call them. This person says, I don't like calling. Then, in a haste, we have made a decision. And this person must be willing to do all that. Help them to you know, step out of their comfort zones. Uh, uh, and then you know, see that you know, they are able to uh, you know, not be complacent. Uh, just be there for them to build them up, to stir them up, uh, and you know, continue to push them to get off the ground, to get off their comfort zone. So these are simple steps that we can do uh, to help people move from being cell members to uh, eventually being cell leaders. Uh, Kennedy, sorry, uh, since I was projecting the notes, I didn't see your question. OK, can we come back? We'll take a break. We'll come back, and then we'll begin with answering Kennedy's question, and then we'll get into our study. Let's take a break. We'll come back in 10 minutes. Thank you.